Eugene's paper explores the existence of an ultra-deep biosphere and explores the possibility that this might be directly connected to the earthquake activity. He examines how the adaptability of biological organisms are much greater than we currently believe, allowing them to exist in conditions we would consider inhospitable. This may also explain the true nature of our hydrocarbons. At the same time, the deep subsurface microorganisms might play a significant evolutionary role, not only providing seismically induced genetic variations and a seed bank for quick recovery after mass extinction, but also modulating longer climatic cycles through planetary-wide bio-geo-electrochemistry. Let's explore Eugene's ultra-deep biosphere hypothesis. So far, the Earth is the only celestial body that demonstrates signs of tectonic activity. We suspect that our tectonic plates move, and in this movement, one of the phenomena they create is earthquakes. At this stage, it is the only planet that we currently know harbours life. But obviously this may well change in the coming years as NASA steps up its drive to find evidence of past and existing life elsewhere in the solar system. McCall in a recent paper provided evidence that tectonic activity may not have been present before life started on Earth. It therefore seems plausible to suggest that the appearance of life may well have triggered the start of tectonic activity, and not the other way around. Eugene focuses on the earthquake aspect of tectonics rather than on the plate movements themselves, and calls his hypothesis the biogenic earthquake hypothesis, and in its simplest form could be stated as living organisms play an active role in the earthquake phenomena. There are a number of different scenarios that we can envision. Firstly, living organisms are the primary cause of an earthquake, and they provide most of the energy release in the event. Secondly, living organisms are the primary cause of an earthquake, but most of the energy released in the event comes from somewhere else. Thirdly, living organisms are not the primary cause of earthquakes, but provide most of the energy. And lastly, living organisms are not the primary cause of earthquakes, and most of the energy released comes from somewhere else. Eugene goes on to examine the energy released during an earthquake. He examines the 1960 earthquake in Chile, which is the largest ever recorded earthquake. This amounted to about 1.6 times 10 to the 19 joules. Assuming that these living organisms are made of cells, there are a number of active processes that can generate energy inside of a cell. He calculates that for an average cell, this may result in a power output of about 2 times 10 to the minus 10 watts. Assuming that the 1960 earthquake released all of its energy in one second, this would mean you would require 10 to the 29 cells. Initially, this may seem like an overwhelmingly large number, but recent estimates of the microbial cells in the oceanic sediments put this at 10 to the 29. But in another context, 10 to the 29 cells is only thought to be about 0.6% of the total biomass on the whole planet. The next question becomes what type of creatures are they and how did they end up here? We will start with the latter first. It is well known that many fault lines are associated with deformations in the crust and steep gradients. These would therefore be areas where the crustal interior is most easily accessible for biological organisms from the surface. To address the question of what type of creatures they are, a reasonable starting assumption would be a unicellular creature. This is mainly as the extreme conditions would not be suitable for multicellular creatures. We already know that there are very hardy unicellular life forms called extremophiles which can withstand the most extreme conditions that were thought to be inhospitable to life only a few years ago. In order to survive in the subsurface biome, they would need to overcome three significant challenges. Number one, the hostile environment conditions. Number two, the lack of nutrients. And number three, the lack of an energy source. 
There have been several different species of extremophiles found thriving at depths of 1.6 kilometers with extreme pressures and temperatures as high as 100 degrees Celsius. In one of the studies, they even found that as they examined the microbes in the core bed samples, they saw that as they examined deeper layers, rather than the microbes becoming more scarce as the pressure increased, they found the opposite. The microbes were actually thriving and dividing at rates that were more than double the layers above. Examination of the sulphide chimneys has revealed the presence of microorganisms who can withstand temperatures ranging between 150 and 300 degrees Celsius. It has also been demonstrated that certain types of bacteria can be exposed to dry heat temperatures as high as 420 Celsius and then be able to successfully replicate afterwards. So how far down could a microorganism survive? Assuming the temperature steadily rises as you go deeper, a conservative estimate will put this at 16 kilometers. We know so little about the temperature gradient below the surface, however. So far, the deepest we have drilled is only about 12 kilometers. And some models show that at depths of 75 kilometers, there would only be a temperature of 430 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 3 gigapascals. And this is exactly where we believe water might exist in the mantle. Laboratory experiments have also shown that although 3 gigapascals is way above the pressure in the oceans, microorganisms can survive at pressures of up to 10 gigapascals. And this is very much counter to what scientists thought was possible as they had assumed that these extreme temperatures and pressures would inhibit vital processes required for life. It appears that our current understanding of the key factors making life possible is far from complete, and the limits of biological adaptability are underestimated. The next thing that we need to consider is the source of nutrients. Eugene identifies two potential sources of nutrients. The first is the conversion of the surrounding minerals, and the second, the recycling of the previous generation of microorganisms. If we examine current models of the mantle, they suggest that there should be noticeable amounts of carbon present in the mantle, although the distribution may not be even. These models also suggest that there should be an abundance of oxygen present and hydrocarbons present in certain minerals, as well as nitrogen and hydrogen and these are all the key elements required for life. Most of these microorganisms would use anaerobic respiration and would require either iron or sulfur, which would be found in abundance at this depth. The final aspect that we need to consider is a source of energy for the microorganisms. The most obvious would be the well-known chemotrophic processes. We would expect the majority to be types that consume environmental carbon and these are called chemoautotrophic types. One further ability that these microbes would have is the ability to perform extracellular electron transfer through highly conductive nanowires. It would effectively allow the microbes to breathe rock at a distance. Similar processes already occur on the ocean floor, where bacteria form long conductive filaments by connecting together. These allow them to transfer electrons from below the ground to the surface where oxygen receives it. This allows them to breathe over distances which are many orders of magnitude greater than they are. Here we not only have an alternative energy source for the deep subsurface biosphere, but it also hints that the energy released during an earthquake might be an electrical phenomena. Eugene is not the first to suggest this connection. Most of the studies usually explain the observations using magnetohydrodynamic, piezomagnetic and electrokinetic effects or crustal asperity in fault zones. None so far have considered the role of biological organisms in this process. It is entirely feasible that if the byproducts of these organisms is electrical current, then this could be the potential energy source for the production of an earthquake. It has been found that the electrical properties of bacterial cells and the charge transfer process during their attachment to mineral surfaces 
impacts the bulk electrical properties of the subsurface environment, potentially also being an unrecognized source of telluric currents. At this stage, it is not clear which of these processes dominate in the earthquake process. It is, however, clear that there is a connection between the ultra deep biosphere, telluric currents, and earthquakes. In part two, we will examine the evidence that underpins this model. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.